So if you're looking for another item to go in the kitchen, Iceland is really nice. Iceland, yeah. 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 No, no, I, I wasn't that I, I'd like to, but I, uh, I need maybe to take a loan from the bank to do that. But <laughs> Okay, um, welcome everybody to the first briefing, press briefing for the joint meeting of the European Planetary Science Congress and the Division of Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. Um, we're delighted to have uh, people here today in the room. I hope that we also have people watching online. Um, we will have a series of presentations and then there will be opportunities for question and answer at the end. Um, you can submit questions through the chat window on the live stream of, uh, of YouTube, via Twitter, or by email emailing our press office. Um, so we have a very prestigious lineup today. Um, firstly, we will hear from Michel Mayor of the University of Geneva. Uh, then we will hear of Kate Isaac of the European Space Agency. Um, then we will hear from Willy Benz of the University of Bern, then Ravi Heller from the University of Zurich, and then David Ehrenreich of the University of Geneva. Um, and we will have a, an update on the status of the CHAOPS mission, which will be launching later on this year. So, Michel, please, over to you. Okay, thank you. So, you don't know we should have a celebration today because, not because we are speaking about chaos, but the fact that it's exactly 20 years after the first transit detection. The 16th of September 99, we have observed the first transit of a planet. In fact, one week before it was already one observation. This is important in fact because really, we really discovered the potential of, of transiting planetary transits but more, you see that here you have the ground-based measurement done in 99. And one year after, our colleague, US colleague, repeats the measurement using the Hubble Space Telescope, and you discover the full, the huge potential to go in space. And it's exactly what happened during the next 20 years. What happened during these next 20 years? Okay, 95 discovery of the first Jovian planet with this crazy period of only 4.2 4 days. And this shows that if the period is so short that we have a good possibility to do detection of planetary transit. And this was the first stimulation to, to search for transit. And in 99, as I said before, we have the first ground-based measurement of a planetary transit. And after you have the huge potential of space, first with Coro space mission, with the discovery of the first rocky planet, Coro 7b, and then after you have the huge, huge harvest of thousands of planetary systems provided by the Kepler mission. And you see this diagram, very fa famous diagram, at least one version of this, with the radius, various period, so you have this huge amount of detection with the red, the different colors showing the multi-planetary system. So not only transit reveal, transit for one planet, but with much more complex system. So this shows a huge possibility, but uh, you need the synergy with uh, ground-based measurement of radial velocity to get the mass of this object to start to do ca comparative planetology. And this is what we are in this period right now. We have the possibility to do spectroscopy of ground-based spectroscopy when you have a transit, comparing the spectra behind and before, uh, be, uh, uh, oh, 
in, Fra in France versus behind transit to get the possibility to get chemical composition, uh, molecules, the temperature, and so on. So this is absolutely a fantastic uh, avenue for the future to get to, to analyze uh, this kind of transit. And evidently, as you, if, if you have to compare the spectra behind and in front of the star, you need a lot of photon because the, the difference is very small and you need a very big telescopes and this will be done with a 30 or more tele meter telescope uh, presently in development in Chile. And I have to mention also the Espresso uh, project with uh, a spectrograph uh, installed last year in, in pa at Paranal with the capability to be connected to four eight meter telescopes. So it's a, a collecting power equivalent to a 16 meter telescope and with the goal to achieve a precision of 10 centimeter per second. So this is typically uh, the, the tool to be expected to, to, to analyze very low mass planets, rocky planet, Earth type planet, and more. This is a path towards the detection of uh, biosignature. So this is a very short summary of the last 20 years. Thank you. Because I, I would like to then move on to, to KOPS and give you a little bit of the context and the status of this uh, uh, space mission. So KOPS um, is an acronym and it stands for Characterizing Exoplanet uh, Satellite. It's a small, so-called S-class science mission in ESA's science program, and even though it's small, it has, still has the same objective as other ESA missions, and that is to achieve world-class science, but now with a very strict budget and very strict uh, schedule constraints. And these are as follows, namely a cost to ESA of 50 million euros, a fast-track development time of four to five years, and in order to achieve this, to be based on existing uh, technology. So this puts it, the, the mission in context as compared to, for example, Rosetta and Bepi that you may have heard of, which are much larger missions which much, with much larger uh, lifetime, longer lifetimes and also much longer development timescales. So the mission is a cooperation between ESA and the Swiss Space Office. And the, uh, the mission is uh, uh, on the community side is based on a KOPS mission consortium, which is led by the University of Bern, and you'll hear more of this from Vili shortly, with uh, important contributions from 10 other ESA member states. The flags are showing on the, on the right-hand side of the, the view graph. Just to show you how fast a mission this really was, the go-ahead to, um, to start building the mission was given in February 24, after the def definition phase, the so-called definition phase, where the details of how the mission was going to be built and scoped were, uh, were put together and declared valid. And it was declared then ready to fly in February 2019, so not so long ago. So it's a mission to de uh, deliver world-class exoplanet science. And specifically what we'll do is to measure the sizes of known exoplanets using the technique of high-precision transit um, photometry that Michelle mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier. It follows on from Coro, from Kepler, and from TESS. And it's the first uh, in a series of three missions uh, from ESA that are dedicated to exoplanet uh, science. KOPS will provide uh, us with key information to understand the structure of small planets and how they form and evolve. And this, this, is, this will be an essential step in a worldwide endeavor, part of which you've heard of, uh, about already and you'll hear about uh, shortly, to search for exoplanets like our own Earth. It's an opportunity not just for the consortium, but also for the community as, uh, at large to, to use the, the telescope, to use the satellite, as there is observing time which is available to the community on the, on the mission. So it's a co cooperation across Europe between ESA and the KOPS Mission Consortium, and there are various different components which are the different uh, uh, parties are responsible for. ESA is the mission architect and procures the platform from Airbus in Spain and provides also the launch opportunity and the guest observers program I just mentioned. The consortium is responsible for the science instrument and for defining 80% of the um, 
uh, observing time, but unlike other larger ESA missions, the consortium has very important r additional roles, uh, fulfilling the task of providing the science team, the science operations center, the mission operations center, and also monitoring the performance of the mission and, its, uh, and how it will be uh, performing throughout its uh, lifetime, also in commissioning, but also over the lifetime, the three and a half year uh, nominal lifetime of the mission. So this is a nice map which shows the international nature or the European nature of the mission, Swiss-led with contributions from Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Sweden and the United Kingdom. And it's a mission that brings together scientists from more than 30 institutes working uh, together with engineers from 20 different industries across 12 different countries, all with a common goal and that is to produce or to realize a satellite, the satellite mission, CHAOPS, that will measure very precisely the radio of small known exoplanets. So where are we now? The on-ground calibration of the instrument and the spacecraft is complete. The satellite is fully integrated and in storage at, A uh, at Airbus in Spain. Final st uh, simulations and rehearsals of launch and earlier op operations are ongoing, just uh, coming towards uh, the end. The science program for the first year of operations is under final review, both by the science team within the mission consortium and uh, within the uh, community at, at large, excuse me. The satellite CHAOPS will launch from Europe's spaceport in French Guiana in mid-December, uh, the end of this year, and we'll start our routine obs observations, where we'll start to be doing our cutting edge science at the beginning of April 2020. So, Billy, really over to you. Not destroy the equipment. Good morning. Uh, so, I will uh, give you a little bit uh, of insight on the mission and the science uh, the KOPS is will eventually be doing. Um, what makes KOPS quite special to all the other, uh, sorry all the other transit missions so far is that CHAOPS is not really a discovery mission, it's a follow-up. So we will be looking at one system at a time and not trying to discover thousands of others. The idea is that uh, we know now several thousands of these exoplanets, we are more interested slowly towards characterizing them with precision, knowing what they're made of, uh, their temperature, and so on and so forth. So CHAOPS is the first step into this direction. Uh, and you can see it as a precision space photometer. That is, it measures the photometry with this transit method that I will show you a bit in one of the following slides. And we are a follow-up mission uh, following interesting targets. So here's what we want to do. Uh, you already saw this mass radius relation maybe in the previous slides where we try by measuring the radius and by knowing the mass with the radial velocities Michel has mentioned, we can place these different planets here and we can try to figure out what they're made of, whether uh, a, a rocky planet, whether a gas ball, a icy uh, uh, world or, or, or the like. So this is the idea and we can see the different lines of color here, different composition and you need to have pretty small error bars if you want to say anything meaningful with this, and that's uh, why we need precision measurements. We want to look at atmosphere, uh, following planets in their orbit around the star. We may want to see if a planet has moons, rings, and so on. And we want to provide uh, so that the best target for the very large facilities that are being in construction or solely going to orbit, like JWST or the EELT, the 40-meter telescope in Chile. Uh, so the concept is simple. When you have a planet orbiting a star, if the planet passes in front of the star, you get a little dip in the light, which you see here by the red arrow. And if an Earth passes in front of the sun, as seen from a distance, you will see 100 ppm, 100 parts per million change in the light. If Jupiter is, is passing, it's a 1%, so it's much bigger. This is 0.01% the change, and you need to go to space to see these kinds of changes. 
And it is the amplitude of these changes in the light that determines then how accurate your mission has to be able to measure the light. If you want to measure an Earth, you have to measure at least 200 ppm, and this defines the measurement requirement. This defines how we built the instrument that is supposed to make these measurements. And so here's the organization. It was said that 11 countries plus ISA, and you have a little bit uh, the different responsibilities on the payload and on the SOX, it's the Science Operations Center, which will be located here in Geneva. And the MOC is a mission operation center. This is where the antenna is, where you get the data and you send up the command, is in Spain, uh, near Madrid. So as you can see, uh, uh, the different contribution in hardware and in, in, in science operation. Uh, here's the telescope. And you can wonder why is a big fuss about a centi 30 centimeter telescope. You can almost buy it in a supermarket. Uh, at the time when uh, you know uh, NASA is about to launch the WST, a 6.5 meter, Europe builds a 49 meter. Uh, uh, why do we bother about and tell you stories about a 30 centimeter telescope? Well, uh, it is because to measure 100 ppm signal, these faint changes of light, you need to have an optical system that's pretty good at registering stray light. So the whole difficulty was to build a system that is capable of measuring uh, uh, these light changes, so minute light, light changes. And just to give you an example, when we wanted to test it in the lab to see if we get capable, we did not find a single light source in the world that was stable to this precision that we could use to test our telescope. So we had to build one, invent one, uh, that was uh, super stable in order to test our instrument. Here's uh, an example of uh, some hardware pictures in, in, in the lab uh, at the University of Bern when we integrated the telescope. Here is how it fits on, on, on the platform. Uh, as was said, this is an Airbus Defense and Space platform, uh, and now the whole satellite is, is in, sp in Spain waiting uh, uh, the transport to Kourou and the later launch. Uh, the launch is, as I said, from Kourou on the Soyuz Fregate. And because it's a small mission, uh, we got a cheap ticket, and which means is we are a secondary passenger uh, of a primary passenger, and the primary passenger is the one that sets all the requirements and the date for launch. And this is an Italian Earth observing satellite, Cosmos SkyMed. And for now, uh, we're scheduled for mid December 2019. The ground segment is also something special. Uh, this is a ground segment that came from the consortium where the commands come down to Madrid, it's red arrows, then come to Geneva for uh, delivering the data products and the commands are written in Geneva and sent back up uh, and everything transits always through the antenna located in Madrid. And that completes what I, my presentation and let's see if we can move this over. Thank you. So I will um, uh, discuss a bit more the theoretical um, perspective um, and how KEOPS uh, contributes to exoplanetary science and also planetary science. So the big questions that we aim to, to answer, and as uh, Michel said, it's, it's already since 20 years, it's how do planets form, what is the occurrence rate of planets, what are the compositions of exoplanets. Of course, we are looking for habitable worlds. Uh, at the same time, we want to better understand the compositions of the planets in our own solar system, and then we want to put our own planetary system in perspective, so to understand how unique is our own solar system. And with KEOPS, we will have the opportunity to uh, measure the, ra the, the radii of, of planets to a very high precision, so 10% is the conservative one, it can, it can be better than that. And of course, that will allow us an accurate determination of the mass register relation of planets, and therefore we can understand something about their composition, internal structure, and we can use this information to better understand their origin and evolution. So you've seen that already. The way we do that is we put planets on the mass register diagram, we have theoretical curves of different compositions, and then when we do this comparison, we try to infer <laughs> the planetary composition, and as we really just said, of course, the better the measurements, uh, the more we can say. At the same time, we also want to 
not just characterize uh, individual planets, but we want to understand the trends. So we want to understand how stellar, uh, how uh, planetary composition depends on the stellar metallicity, the stellar type, the radial distance, or so where it is within the planetary system, um, and of course the planetary mass, the age of the system, and so on. So there are many questions, and we try to really have a more complete theoretical perspective because now we really move from the detection to the characterization uh, phase. And of course, when we do that, we try to be clever and take our knowledge from formation and evolution models so we can exclude some compositions. So we try to see whether there are compositions that are more likely uh, or, or let's say impossible. So here in, in Switzerland, I would say that basically we really make the effort to uh, connect solar system uh, science with exoplanetary science. We have, uh, we have a lot of collaboration on that, and we really have to take advantage of this, these two groups of, of the solar system. We have only eight planets, but we have very accurate measurements, so we have ongoing missions of in, in the sol solar system exploration. And at the same time, we can take advantage of, of uh, the large number of, of exoplanets, which, although they have only measurements of the basic properties, they give us the overview. And then we can look for trends, and by Combining that, we can really enhance our knowledge. Um, I think when it comes to exoplanetary science, there, is, uh, there, there are people who really like the gas giant planets, and there are people who like the terrestrial, Earth-like planets, but then actually there is a large population of planets with intermediate masses and radii, and actually they are very common in the galaxy. And these are planets that uh, we don't know how to characterize so much. We don't know if it's like if they are small scale of, of uh, Jupiter or large scales of um, of the Earth. And with Keops, we will be able to uh, hopefully uh, characterize more these intermediate uh, mass uh, planets. And we have this kind of planets in our own solar system, Uranus and Neptune. So of course, we also make effort to understand better Uranus and Neptune hopefully have a mission in the future to this, to this planet, and again, use these two complementary groups to better understand this, this planetary class. So this I said already, I really think that we, we make uh, progress in combining this, the, these, two, these two groups of solar system planets and exoplanets. Um, at the same time, we try to combine modeling and observation, so of course we need both. Uh, we need theories, we need simulations, we need, we need predictions, we need, to, we need theory for the interpretation, but of course, as we said, this will not work if we don't have accurate measurements. So this is also something that we are, uh, we are working on. Um, and again, when it comes to planetary characteriz characterization, uh, we really try to look at this, this uh, global picture of combining planet formation with planetary evolution and the internal structure, how it evolves with time, and the current state internal structure so we can better understand planet in a, in a more global sense. Thank you. Good morning. So I'm, I'm going to finish by uh, describing how uh, Keops, a small mission, uh, fits in the bigger landscape of older uh, space mission and the ground-based instruments that will also target uh, exoplanets. And uh, to do that, I will start uh, at the time when uh, Keops was uh, selected in 2012. And uh, it was selected uh, basically at the end uh, of uh, an era uh, pioneered by uh, Michel Mayor, um, where most known exoplanets were detected from the ground uh, around uh, bright stars. And um, the handful of these planets that were known to transit uh, their bright star at the time uh, are still today uh, prototypical objects uh, that could have been uh, studied in detail uh, using, uh, for instance, Hubble and Spitzer from space to characterize their atmosphere. And you need to have a bright star uh, to do that. Um, in the meantime, the, uh, the pioneering uh, mission Corot and Kepler has, uh, they had started to change the game already by uh, discovering more and more uh, transiting planets, but they were uh, mostly uh, transiting faint stars. So um, you see here that the problem was that we had only a handful of uh, bright planets that we could study in detail, 
And when KIOPS was selected, one of its uh, main scientific goals uh, was to, uh, to, to try and find transits of these uh, bright planets detected from the ground to uh, increase the number of, of planets for which we could, we could go much farther and study their atmospheres. Uh, to complete the picture, um, the, so in 2013, uh, Gaia uh, was launched and uh, it, it, was, it, it was supposed and it does provide accurate parameters for planet host stars and it's extremely important because you can only know an exoplanet as much as you know its host stars. So uh, the input of Gaia has been, uh, has been critical and uh, the, James Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope uh, at this time was set for launch uh, soon after Chaos. And of course, uh, if you look at uh, the landscape now, it has substantially changed. Uh, uh, now we are uh, contemplating the imminent launch of Chaos. Um, well, there's a, a whole new uh, uh, business here, that since we have entered an era where most exoplanets are now, uh, are now detected uh, from space, uh, including uh, transiting across bright stars. So Kepler has been extended, so it's called the K2 <coughs> mission. Uh, TESS, uh, uh, the TESS satellite has started, uh, started operation, and uh, in the future, uh, the uh, PLATO mission from the European Space Agency, all of these missions are basically dedicated to discover new planets transiting uh, bright stars. And in the meantime, we have learned how to characterize the atmosphere of exoplanets from the ground, hence the uh, advance of extremely large uh, telescopes um, share a lot of uh, promises with regards to uh, the characterization of, uh, of small planets. And uh, in spite of these uh, substantial uh, changes, and because it is uh, a very flexible uh, mission, it's almost like a space Swiss knife, it's very versatile, Keops is uh, more relevant uh, 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 than ever because it will actually um, take advantage of the synergies with all these missions. And I will just exemplify uh, one here. Uh, actually, uh, we think that in the, in, the coming, uh, in the coming years, there will be far too many uh, very interesting planets, small planets to characterize uh, with powerful facilities than observing time available on these, uh, uh, on these uh, powerful facilities. So it will become extremely important to uh, down-select uh, the golden target, the very best of these targets, so that we could uh, go and spend a lot of time with the Hubble, with James Webb, and with the ELT underground. And Keops is going to be uh, key uh, in, in this process by confirming and obtaining a first step characterization of these targets, of these many targets, to determine which one we should, we should, we should look for. And we now believe that thanks to these kind of synergies, uh, Keops is actually uh, even more relevant than uh, at the time it was, uh, it was selected. So thank you very much. So thank you very much to all our speakers for their presentations. Um, do we have questions from people in the room or people online? Can you state your name and your affiliation? Hello. Uh, my name is Antonio Broto, and I am from a Spanish news agency, FA, and I have two questions. The first one is, I see that the rocket is the Soyuz frigate. Is that Russian technology, given that name? And the second one, as I am Spanish, I'm very interested on the role of this Madrid Command Center. And if you can give us some more background on if it's the first time that, that uh, this command center uh, works in this kind of uh, mission, exoplanetary uh, mission, and if uh, you can tell us other missions in in which uh, Madrid has worked. Thank you. Um, I say, yeah. Yes, I indeed, it's, uh, um, the name is, uh, is, as you say, a giveaway. It is a, a, a Russian-based launcher, but the launch will take place from the uh, European spaceport in French Guiana. Mm -hmm. So you kind of consider that Russia is also uh, working on this? 
You, you, no. you don't consider Russia is also helping in this mission? No, it's a, it's a, techno it's a technology which is, bought, which is bought in. Okay, the ground segment in Madrid is located at Inta, uh, in the suburbs of, of, of Madrid. Uh, and uh, I think they have, uh, uh, Spain has developed over the years uh, the capability of doing small satellite and this uh, center, command center, mission operation center is being used together with another Spanish mission called PAS uh, that uh, Spain has launched, I think. Uh, and uh, running uh, simultaneously both. So they've built a command center for uh, a program that Spain wants to develop uh, for smaller missions. One is already uh, on the schedule and has been developed sort of uh, in parallel by Spain alone. Yeah, I think it's a military mission from Spain called PAS and, and they're using the same antenna and the same uh, uh, location, same building in, in Inta in the suburbs of Madrid. Maybe I can elaborate yeah. a little bit just to, just to say from the, at least from the ESA science uh, program perspective, as you may know, the Mission Operations Center is typically at ESOC, so in, in Darmstadt in, in Germany, and the Science Operations Center is typically, um, or science operations are typically run from ESAC in, in, in Spain. So here we have a slightly different situation where the Mission Operations Center is in, as part of the consortium, is uh, in, uh, in Madrid, and the science operations, the task that is normally uh, done in, uh, in Spain, is, uh, is, uh, will be done in, in Geneva. So it's a slightly different um, constellation. Well, it all derives from these requirement on these small missions, right? That Kate mentioned at the beginning, uh, it was to cost 50 million to the agency. And so within this envelope, you can do a certain number of things, but you cannot do the whole mission. So the, whole, the rest of uh, uh, was brought to, to by the consortium. And each individual country has brought its contribution, and Spain has brought the contribution of the mission operations center. very famous missions like Kepler or Hubble, Spain also have this kind of role, or is this is the first time, or? No, Kepler and, and Hubble, uh, uh, well, Kepler was a, a NASA mission, so it was uh, the, the mission operation and everything else was located in the US. And uh, uh, with, with Hubble, the, the, the main part was the Hubble Space Telescope Institute, which had Europeans there. ESA part uh, uh, contribution to the Space Telescope Institute, and uh, but but it was not located in, in Madrid. But but Madrid has a, a, a program of small emission Earth observing. CEOSAT is, is one example that comes to my mind. Uh, beyond uh, or the, uh, on top of PAS, uh, so 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 Spain has uh, uh, a number is very active in in, in space in, in these missions. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from people in the room, people online? I saw that there were 30 people watching, so um, please do send in questions for the team while you have access to them. Uh, Thomas Schumann, I'm a freelance journalist from Denmark. Um, I was wondering about the orbit of the uh, satellite. Um, it looks like it's going to enter low Earth orbit. Could you talk about how that would affect the uh, observations? Yeah, uh, so the, the orbit is an interesting thing. We, it was a result of a lot of uh, work and, and discussions, and in the end, it is a 700 kilometer high orbit. It's a sun synchronous with a longitude of the ascending node at 6 a.m. In other words, the satellite goes from pole to pole, and it turns around, the orbit turns around the Earth, and it also follows more or less the day-night uh, uh, terminator. And the idea is to always observe stars that are located over the dark side of the Earth. The idea is to avoid, again, to make this precise measurement of light. You want to avoid having light 
coming from the Earth entering stray light from the Earth entering the telescope. You want to avoid stray light being reflected on the moon entering the telescope. And all this gives you a bunch of constraints that tells you where, when you can observe in the sky. Uh, but uh, the major part is, is, is uh, the Earth itself. Now, being in a low Earth orbit has the advantage it's relatively cheap. Uh, it doesn't require too much fancy communication. Uh, but it has disadvantages. The Earth hides part of the sky. It occults part of the sky. You're flying through radiation belts, which create troubles in your electronic and in your detector. Uh, so, so the whole thing was the best we could do. Uh, and I think uh, Coho was also in a similar kind of orbit. It was not a polar orbit the same way, but it was also at roughly the same altitude. It's a bit higher, but, but also a lower Earth orbit. And so this is this what we hope we optimized all the possible factors to 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 make the measurements as, as precise as possible. Uh, I didn't quite understand the thing that was special about the mirror. You said it's 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 only a thirty centimeter centimeter mirror, but there was something about it that made it you know different still. I didn't understand that. Yeah, the, the part that makes it different is, is all the optical design that has been optimized to avoid stray light to reach the detector. Right? You can have, a, you have your telescope, you're looking at a target, but then you have the moon a bit on the right side, and part of the light from the moon enters your telescope, and you're not careful, it bounces back and forth in your tube, and part of it ends up on the detector. And that creates noise in your measurement. And, and when you want to make these measurements to 100 ppm, you cannot afford having noise. So everything has been engineered to minimize the noise. For example, the temperature of the CCD is controlled to 10 milli-degrees. The temperature of the tube is controlled. Uh, there are, there is a lot of optical design that has gone into limiting the stray light and therefore optimizing the performance of the measurement. And this is what made the construction of this not trivial. Thank you. Do we have more questions from people here, people watching online? Yes. Uh, one more question, sorry. Uh, you said that the priority of this mission is to study that the exoplanets that we already know, but uh, is it possible that we discover new planets with this mission as well? Somebody else wants to? Um, yes, it is possible, uh, because um, in particular there are um, planetary systems out there, and uh, we don't necessarily know all the planets. So if we want to follow up uh, one known planet uh, for trying to detect its transit, then if one transits, it's likely that if there are others, and now we know that uh, many, many uh, stars have not one but several planets, it's likely that the other will also transit. Simply, if we, maybe we don't know them uh, previously, so by following up the one we know to look for the transit, we may, in some cases, uh, find uh, another transit that is related to another planet, and then it would mean that uh, this is another planet, a surprise uh, planet, a surprise transit. So it's, uh, it's possible indeed to, to have that. Any more questions? Okay, I think in that case, um, I would like to thank very much the speakers um, today, Michel Mayor. Uh, Kate Isaac, Billy Benz, Clavi Teleb, and David Iron uh, sorry. Um, excuse me for mangling your name. Um, I would just like to give, sorry, a couple of updates, yes, um, on the press briefing schedule for the next couple of days. Tomorrow, at the same time, we have a briefing on Hayabusa 2. Um, unfortunately, our Osiris Rex speakers have dropped out, however, 
We now have uh, Frank Marchis from the SETI Institute who will be talking about observations of the target for the Lucy mission. Um, on Wednesday, we have a, uh, a mixed briefing about future missions, um, including the AIDA mission, which includes the DART mission from NASA and the European Space Agency's HERA mission. We also have an update on the Envision mission candidate to Venus uh, from the European Space Agency and the <coughs> Mars sample return architecture current plans and status. On Thursday, we have a Venus-related briefing, which will cover new results from the Akatsuki mission, and also discuss uh, Venus flybys of, um, sorry, coordinated uh, observations of Venus in 2020 uh, with Akatsuki and Becky Colombo. And Michael Way from NASA's Goddard Institute of Space Science will be talking about possible habitability of the ancient Venus. Um, we have. We have one question, excellent. Um, how many exoplanets will CUBES be able to characterize over its uh, 3.5 year primary mission? So we, we have about uh, 300 targets uh, in the guaranteed time observation program. And I, I believe uh, something like maybe a dozen uh, more on the open time program. Mm -hmm, yeah. So the order of magnitude is about uh, is, is a few hundred uh, systems. Okay. Um, unless there's any any more questions, um, in that case, thank you very much for coming. Um, we'll close this briefing, and we hope to see you tomorrow uh, for our briefing briefing on Hyde <laughs> Two and Lucy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, you have to ask the others if they want to do this. Hello. Well, I'm Caterina Boccato from Padova. Yes. I work with Roberto Ragazzoni, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you are coming sure. to Padova in two weeks. In October. Yeah, yeah, 17 of October. In October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Yes, yes. And uh, so.